Hello, you're listening to a brand new episode of Popcorn Podcast with Lee and Tim. And this week, we're bringing you our review of See How They Run, plus covering off all the latest movie and trailer news. I'm Timmy Fland, movie buff. And I'm Lee Livingstone, entertainment journalist. And we love to talk all things movies. We do. And this episode, we're talking See How They Run, which is set in the West End of 1950s London, where plans for a movie version of Agatha Christie's The Mousetrap come to a halt after the film's Hollywood director is murdered. Inspector Stoppard and rookie constable Stalker take on the case and find themselves thrown into a puzzling and perilous whodunit. The film is directed by Tom George from a screenplay by Mark Chappell. The movie stars Saoirse Ronan, Sam Rockwell, Adrian Brody, Ruth Wilson, Reese Shearsmith, Harris Dickinson, Shirley Henderson and David Oyelowo, among uh, quite a few others. Now, The Mousetrap, Agatha Christie's yep. Mousetrap, on the London West End. It has mm-hmm. been playing there for 68 years, not yep. out. We've both lived in London over time. Mm-hmm. Did you see it when no. you were there? No, <laughs> I neither did I. I didn't. I, I feel like I didn't have the full London experience. We're not seeing this show. It's not like it didn't hang around for me long enough yeah. and I still didn't get myself to see it. It's shameful. Uncultured. Uncultured, Lee and I. <laughs> so this story is a whodunit within a whodunit with lots of self-referential yes. nods to the genre in really fun ways. It wasn't too on the nose, I thought. Do you agree? Oh gosh, I had so much fun watching this movie. It was just this delicious mix of fact versus fiction within yeah. this genre, which I just love. Yeah. And somehow it's been done and done and done, but it injected something fresh and it interesting did. and compelling for me. And not only is the movie poking fun at the genre, it's also based on the real play, as you said, mm. which is the longest running show ever. Is that right? By That's far. the fact. You mentioned 68 years. It opened in 1952 and has run continuously until the pandemic when it had to temporarily close. It's something like 28,000 performances, more than that now. Goodness me. And so this movie is set around the 100th performance. Which is a milestone because my husband Josh works in theatre, right? Yep. The 100th show, especially in this market in Australia, because shows come and go and they tour quite mm. quite often, the 100th show is a huge milestone. So to think that this film is based in 1953, they're celebrating the 100th show mm. and then time passes to the present day and you're saying they've done 28,000 shows? Yeah. That's insane. It's insane. So the requirement for a whodunit is obviously you have to have all the ensemble cast. Yes. Everybody in Hollywood needs <laughs> to be involved. And they certainly are involved here. <laughs> and there's a lot of really fun things from real life referenced in the film too. So the terms of the contract that's mentioned in the film that an official movie can't be made until six months after the play stops running is a real clause that Agatha Christie put in her contract for this play. That's fact? That is true. That's wild. It cannot be made until six months after the play stops running and it has never (laughs) stopped running. That makes the runtime and that clause in the contract be it now. I didn't realise that was real. That is fucking hilarious. Yeah. So there have been a couple of non-English language films that are sort of inspired. Loosely based. By it, yes, but it's never been made into a film. So here they are making basically... The mouse trap, but like in this meta, in a really way, clever way, really clever way. It's like okay, so we can't make the mouse trap, but let's just make a who done it around the mouse trap. Yeah. I think that's genius. Here's another tidbit for you. Okay, so the title of the movie, see how they run, mm-hmm. is a reference to the short radio play that the story and the full play is based on, called Three Blind Mice. Ah, see how they run. See how they run. Three blind mice. There you go. And the radio play was actually written as a birthday present for Queen Mary. Oh my gosh. So there you go. You're coming at me with all these facts. It's really fascinating and I love when you get all the layers and you start unpicking all the layers of the film. It just makes it more enjoyable. Right. So you went down a bit of a see how they run Agatha Christie's (laughs) mousetrap rabbit hole. Can I give you one more? Yes. Oh my gosh, please. So Inspector Stoppard's name, who's played by Sam Rockwell, Mm -hmm. is a nod to the playwright Tom Stoppard, whose 1968 play The Real Inspector Hound is a parody of The Mousetrap. Oh my gosh. And it uses similar themes that are found within this film. So many layers to this you know, movie. You play within a play or play within film a, within a film. Yeah. Yes. Oh, gosh. And, you know, that is a tried and tested genre. 
And as I said before, this is so much fun. Just to build on the producer that acquired the film rights, Mm -hmm. his name was John Wolfe. And the pedigree of films that he had behind his back, and this just makes me think how pissed off. Clearly he was in the film, but in real life, like Mm. surely he's still not alive now, 68 years later. He's probably in his 40s or 50s at the time. He had produced The African Queen, Day of the Jackal, and the absolutely classic musical Oliver. Yep. So he had his sights set on this absolute stunning, very successful London West End play to turn into a movie. Yeah. And he's gone to the grave without having been able to make it. Yeah. Gosh. <laughs> frustration. So frustrating. But also in the film referenced is his real life wife uh-huh. at the time. Yeah. And his mistress. They're real people. Really? Mm-hmm. Oh, gosh. Oh, thank you for going into all this uh, research. It's just interesting to see which characters are real and, and which, which aren't. aren't. So I think the director who, you know, is a really unlikable character played by Adrian Brody. He's, Leo Kopernik is yeah, his name. He's not real. Ah, But okay. the theatre entrepreneur Petulia Spencer yes. is actually based on Peter Spencer. A man, yes. Yeah. And they rewrote the character as a woman. I did know that. Yes, there Coming you go. at me with another fact <laughs> that I knew. <laughs> Just uh, on Leo Kopernik, who is played by Adrian mm. Brody brilliantly as this arrogant prick of oh, the Hollywood director. He's so director. unlikable. He advises everything about the whodunit. Like, you've seen one, you've seen it all, mm. you know, old tried, been done a thousand times. He is that sort of voiceover guide. I guess that reliable slash unreliable narrator throughout. Yeah. Obviously, he's not going to reveal who the killer is, but he kind of sets the context, the tone, mm-hmm. and what we're in for for the next yeah. hour and 40 minutes. And I, I quite liked that creative choice. What did you think of the screenplay and the dialogue? I, I thought it was sharp. I thought it was witty. Yep. It was playful. I was obsessed with yep. it. The screenplay is by Mark Chappell, who presents all of these aspects of a murder mystery to you in a wink-wink way yep. that isn't patronising. No. You know, it, we're very much in on the joke. Yes. And that's a really hard thing to pull off. So hard. It's very self-aware, but it finds the right balance of throwing in things like really ridiculous puns, but it comes to the delivery of the actors, mm. which we'll talk about later. There's so many things in this script and this story and how it comes together that not necessarily should work, but they do. Yeah. You've got different levels of the dialogue, like one that really sets you in the period of the piece. Like mm-hmm. if I can pull out an example, he's all over us like hot jam on a Devonshire scone. <laughs> Yum. <laughs> yeah. And that's a brilliant line because it's a great way to set not only the tone, but the mm. period of yes. the piece. And there's also another one like, it's a whodunit. If you've seen one, you've seen them all. Yes. Very tongue-in-cheek and meta. And that is also a risk. I always think that screenwriters who put those words to paper and mm. have actors say it is really fucking ballsy. Because what they're saying is, I invite you to criticise this movie mm. to either challenge the fact that you've seen one, you've seen it all, but have you really? Because we have this new film. And I think that's really cheeky and fun. And they pull yep. it off because this is different. Yeah, they deliver it in a really fun, unique yes. way. Yeah. There's also a line, one of the writers of the film, the fictional film, mm. is lamenting that flashbacks are crass <laughs> and interrupt the flow of the story <laughs> while he's in the midst of a flashback. Yes. You know, things yeah. like that are just really, you know, wink, wink, nod, yeah. nod without hitting you over the head with it. And as you said, it's a fine line because if you don't yes. get it right, mm-hmm. the audience can just roll their eyes and go, oh, okay, yeah. Now, do you think the way that they got it so right is because of the cast? Do we want to talk yes. about the cast and the characters in this wonderful yes, film? Please. So Saoirse Ronan. She Mm -hmm. plays Constable Stalker. She likes the escape, the romance, and the silver screen as a line of dialogue. She says she is, I guess, us in a way. She's that cinephile. She loves movies, she loves stories, and she Mm -hmm. loves getting into solving crime, although she's quite green, isn't she? She is very green. (laughs) She's a rookie cop who's paired with Sam Rockwell's hardened detective. Mm. The chemistry between them... Not necessarily romantically, just no. the back and forth buddy comedy kind of style of them so good. is really, really good. They're mm. complete opposites, which creates some really good friction mm. in the story that they need to then overcome. Yeah. And they just work so well together. They really do. Look, it's hard to pick my favourite character in the movie. When you have an ensemble that's so delicious like this, mm. it's like you don't want to pick your favourite child. But yum, 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 yum. I loved <laughs> Nummies. I loved how, of course, how inexperienced and naive she was, but she wasn't dumb. And that was a really clear mm. distinction. And that comes through the performance of Saoirse Ronan. Yeah. 
I loved her enthusiasm so much for the job, her eagerness to learn. She really gave it all. Mm. And she's also, like the film itself, she's very self-aware that she can chew your ear off. Yeah. She just wants you to trust her. Yeah. And I found that a really endearing part of her character. One of the best bits I loved about her character is the way she keeps jumping to conclusions. <laughs> Literally. Like declaring, case closed, after they interview every single person. She's well, like, well, of course they did it. Yeah, 15 minutes into the movie. <laughs> but the, the good thing about that is that she did it like two or three times. Times yeah, and it never got old no. because it was just so. Oh, it's just so. Wonderful. And then she's like, "Oh, I did it again, didn't I?" Yeah, I jumped to conclusions. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> we mentioned Adrian Brody earlier as the sleazy blacklisted American director Leah Kopernik. Mm-hmm. He's a very comical villain of the piece. He's maniacal. I don't know. He's Mel- a bit <laughs> uh, what, what's that word? Melodramatic. Mel- melodramatic. Yeah. Machiavellian. Maybe yes. not. Yes. Machiavellian. Yes. Yeah. He just gets everyone offside. He's instantly unlikable. Yes. He's like a, a professional get everyone offsider. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's for sure. We mentioned Ruth Wilson as Petulia Spencer, a theatre entrepreneur who, as we said, is based on Peter Spencer, who owned a bunch of theatres in London in the 1950s. Yes. The calibre of this cast just as a whole is incredible. All the Oscar and BAFTA winners you could stuff into a movie. Right, they're all here. Yeah. Can we talk about Sam Rockwell as oh, Inspector yes, Stoppard, a cynical rough around the edges detective, but, you know, underneath it all he's probably suffering a bit of PTSD yes. from serving in the war, which yeah. adds some gravitas behind this really specific, tender, endearing performance that only Sam Rockwell could deliver. Yeah, and makes him the perfect foil for Sir Ronan's right? green rookie. Yeah, and you mentioned the chemistry between them, I mean, it, mm. it shouldn't work, but it does. Yeah, they just bounce off each other effortlessly, yeah. I they think. They make such a good team. And I've got to give special mention to Harris Dickinson and Pearl Shander, who play mm. Richard Attenborough, the real actor, yeah. and his real wife, of all people. They originally starred as Sergeant Trotter and Molly Ralston in the play when it opened. So they're based on real people. So that's a fact. Yeah. I mean, look, Harris Dickinson is... is a really charming young actor playing David Attenborough, that mm. would have been pretty stressful. Yeah, because he really pulls it off. Because Richard Attenborough was one of the most popular and handsome actors of his time. And he knows it too. He's, <laughs> he does he, a little he's bit. He's quite pompous in this, but you love him all the same. Yeah. I was worried initially how Harris was depicting Richard Attenborough because I thought, oh my gosh, don't paint him as this pompous buffoon, this bit of a dick or like he thinks he's better than everyone else, but I don't think you feel that in the end. No, he pulled his performance back enough to keep it grounded. Yes, indeed. Let's jump into Shirley Henderson as Agatha Christie. I love Shirley Henderson. How good is she? She's really, really great. We've seen her in Harry Potter, of course. Yes, as as Moaning Moaning Myrtle, Myrtle, (laughs) which is just one of the best pieces of casting in in that series. She is such a brilliant character Mm -hmm. actor. And this is an Agatha Christie we've never quite seen before. Do you think? I don't know that I've ever seen Agatha Christie herself on film. Actually, are you serious? I don't think I, so. I don't know if we have either. No. Well, certainly not as quirky and kooky <laughs> as we do here. Was she that reclusive? I guess maybe she was. I mean, it seems such a heightened version of herself. It must be somewhat true. Mm. I mean, she put a clause in <laughs> her contract about her beloved plays not getting turned into films. I mean, that She was very from... passionate about her works, yes. definitely. Yeah. But you loved Shirley Henderson in this role? Oh, I, I loved her. And I actually wish, without spoiling anything, that there was more of her in this movie. Yeah. But it was just the perfect amount and just sprinkled in. Which <laughs> sprinkled was just, on. Yeah, sprinkled a sprinkling in. of Shirley. Sprinkling of Shirley Henderson. Yeah. We love it. Uh, we've got to talk about the set and the costumes because they're absolutely incredible. Mm. The film was shot in and around abandoned theatres and hotels yes. during London's pandemic shutdown. So they were just like having the best time running all over London and all these beautiful buildings with all, you know, London's full of such history and oh. incredible architecture. And so they just had their pick and choice of different places. They even shot on a property once owned by Richard Attenborough. Oh, you know, I just love this. When we were looking into this, um, you know, preparing for this episode, I thought, obviously, the pandemic was awful and it's still ongoing. But this is such a delightful occurrence that happened as a result of that, where the access to all these theatres that were closed, to be able to set it within that time period. It's just wonderful. And it just adds a layer of real authenticity to this film that they probably wouldn't have been able to deliver if it was all done on sound stages, to no. be honest. There was something like 70 dressed sets wow. across theatres, music halls, film studios, and as I said, even a property owned by Richard Attenborough. 
They also chose not to be too specific to the period as well. A bit of creative license around yeah. how things came together. A more modern 1950s? Yeah, more modern 1950s. More colour, more vibrancy. Yeah, more colour. They, they pulled like the reds from the theatres throughout all the costumes mm. and other things like that. So it was a really unique aesthetic for this movie that just worked in the sort of film and the tone that they were looking to produce. Just gorgeous costume design by yes. Odile Dix Moreau who did Last Night in Soho. Ah. Which was fashion heavy. Very fashion heavy. Yeah. Great. Oh gosh, how good, how beautiful is London in any decade? Yep. But the 50s especially, just stunning. Yeah, they made a dreary sort of London town come to life in a really colourful way. Yeah, they did. And this is just that, a very colourful movie in more yes. ways than one. There's some interesting filming techniques used and editing techniques to uh, show the different angles yeah. of the same scene. They call that a split screen. So they use split screen quite a bit in this film. And it's really good. It's a good technique in murder mysteries because it keeps the action yes. brisk. Yes, it keeps energy in the genre. And it's used sparingly, like not too much, but when they use it, it works perfectly. Like, for example, when they're running through the theatre trying to chase the killer and you're seeing all the different hallways and stairwells yeah. and different perspectives and things. It was good fun. It was really good fun. There was a bit of Benny Hill about that where they're all opening doors and <laughs> appearing <laughs> from different <laughs> doors. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it really is true. Yeah, it's quite good. Shall we wrap up our review of See How They Run? Yes, let's do it, Lee. So... See How They Run is a bloody good time. I loved it and would definitely watch again. The pacing, mystery, characters and script are wickedly good. I laughed so much and was really invested in the series of events that, of course, I never saw coming. Not surprising for me, but that's not to discount the really, really tight script that delivers that outcome. I love this genre and I'm so glad we got such a fresh and fun take on it with this film. I'm going to rate See How They Run for Popcorn Kernels. We'll see how they run is a meta comedy murder mystery with a stellar cast that isn't overly ambitious in the way it presents itself, but cleverly twists the tropes of the genre, the author and the famous play to honour their enduring legacy. It playfully blends fact and fiction to create a fun film that will keep you guessing. I'm going to give it four popcorn kernels too. There we go, on the same page and you can see, see how they run in Australian cinemas from September 29. So, Tim, the biggest news of this past week is without a doubt that Deadpool 3 will bring back the one and only Hugh Jackman as Wolverine in September 2024. Like, literally, what the actual fuck? <laughs> I know, I, I love I, it. I, I, I did not see this coming at all. I'm so keen. Like, are we in a dream? Like, that's a serious question. It's a wonderful dream that I do not want to wake up Don't from. Don't you dare wake me up. Ryan Reynolds and Jackman released a couple of videos on social media teasing the return in the next Merc with a Mouth solo film. The first since Disney's acquisition of 21st Century Fox. Now, I've got so many questions and I know you yeah. have no answers, but what does this mean? It better be more than a cameo, let me tell you that. Surely. They wouldn't make such a hullabaloo if he was just going to show up in an end credit scene or something like that. Yeah. Uh, it's going to be Deadpool and Wolverine in a buddy film. Do you know there's Fuck. also talk of Tom Holland making a cameo as Spider-Man? Oh, I mean, gimme, gimme, gimme. It's just going to be a cameo fest, isn't it? <laughs> because also, what does this mean for the other X-Men cast members that we've known for the last I don't know. 20 or so years? I mean, Hugh Jackman had hung up the claws. I don't know how you hang up claws, but <laughs> yeah. he had retracted, retracted his claws. And then here he is again. So, I mean, what other surprises yeah. have we got around the corner? I just can't wait. And, of course, the biggest thing they need to address is the end of Logan. Right. Where, spoiler alert, he dies. Yeah. But that's a different timeline. There's been so many timelines in yes. the MCU with, when it comes to the X-Men that mm. I think they can play with this and it'll be fine. I'm sure they will find a way. Yeah. Well, and if that wasn't enough exciting news, Marvel President Kevin Feige has teased the return of Elizabeth Olsen's Wanda in the MCU, saying, and I quote, I don't know that we saw her under rubble. I saw a tower coming down and a little red flash. I don't know what that means. Oh, what a he's tease. He's playing with our hearts there, Kevin Feige. I mean, look, we saw this coming. I, I was yeah. unconvinced she was actually dead in Multiverse of Madness. No. When pressed for details, Feige avoided sharing whether we would see the character in a solo film, another Avengers film, or the Agatha Coven of Chaos TV series that stars Catherine Hahn, adding only, there really is so much more to explore. Anything's possible in the multiverse. Oh, gosh, Kevin Feige. 
<laughs> so in more MCU news, the planned Armor Wars series starring Don Cheadle as James Rhodey Rhodes, a.k.a. War Machine, is being rethought as a film to better honour the story. Now, the series was originally going to tie into the series Secret Invasion about a Skrull invasion of Earth, but it's not known where the movie will fit now. I mean, it might still fit around the same sort of time. I think this yeah. is a cool move. I'd like to just see a movie. I mean, look, we, we've discussed this at length offline because we don't cover TV shows on the podcast, but the Falcon and the Winter Soldier mm-hmm. series should have and would have been better served as a film. So, mm. may oh, I was quite bored watching those six episodes. It didn't really, really go anywhere. Okay. I would have said that about Moon Knight. I think that could have been a film. I'm still on episode <laughs> two. <laughs> you but can't I get have, through it. But I have finished Ms. Marvel. And I am now up to date on She-Hulk. Yeah. So just cut me some slack. I'll get to Moon Knight eventually. (laughs) Well, this seems like a good move either way. Yes, I agree. Okay, so after being in development hell for years, production on Beverly Hills Cop Axel Foley, the fourth instalment in the 80s hit film series, is now moving fast, adding Kevin Bacon to the cast with newcomers Joseph Gordon-Levitt and Taylor Page alongside Beverly Hills Cop alumni Eddie Murphy as Axel Foley, of course, and Judge Ryan hold Paul Reiser and Bronson Pinchot. Now the film is being developed by Netflix and not much is known about the story just yet but it's safe to say Foley will be up to his old tricks bending the rules and rubbing people up the wrong way in his police work and we can expect to see it next year in 2023. Now colour me surprised about this one. Okay. I thought we'd flogged this franchise to death but apparently not. Excuse the pun. It's... (laughs) There's a new American Pie movie in the works, the first since American Reunion in 2012. It will mark the fifth film in the franchise since the smash hit original had us all craving warm apple pie in 1999. Now, you've put that in the notes. I don't know that I agree with that sentiment, to be honest. uh, Maybe that should have been the line I said as part of the balance here. I love that you got to say it. Uh, There have also been a sleuth of straight-to-DVD versions under the American Pie IP. Now, surely it's done to death. Have you watched any of those straight to DVD no. films? I just I've just stuck to the film, the versions, central ones, the yeah. central core stories. So reports say that this new film is based on an original pitch by Sajata Day and is described as a fresh take on the long running sex comedy franchise. There's no word on a release date or who of the cast will be returning yet. But do you think the likes of Jason Biggs, Alison Hannigan, Sean William Scott? Chris Klein. They've got to get Jennifer Coolidge back. They have to. She is the lady of the day. Tara Reid, maybe not. Eugene Levy, be cool to have him back. I mean, his popularity surged with uh, Schitt's Creek recently. So good. We've got Natasha Lyonne as part of the cast as well. I don't know. Will you know, they she be never had, She never had a really huge role, but she was no. one of my favourite characters, though. And again, she's having some sort of renaissance, you know, that brilliant show on Netflix, Russian yes. Doll. Yes. Oh, I love that show. And she was a voice in DC League of Super Pets. Yes. She was Merton the Turtle. Brilliant. Brilliant piece of casting there. Look, I don't know. What, what does fresh take mean? Are we going down the requel pathway? Are we just going to reheat some slices of apple pie? Yeah. Oh, nothing's good reheated. No, the pastry just doesn't work. It just doesn't work. (laughs) This metaphor's getting a bit out of control. (laughs) I love it. Well, okay, let's go off planet here. So, a new Planet of the Apes film was announced this week from 20th Century Studios. Releasing in 2024, the fourth film in this series will be titled Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes. Now, I've told you this before, but I've never been a huge fan of these films. And I'm really surprised by that, actually. I'm just not into films where people battle animals. Sure. You know? like Hard pill to swallow. Yeah, but then you look back on things like Jaws and all that kind of stuff, like those kind of films were fine for the time, but yeah. when you make the animals sentient and then they mm. start, I just think, mm, no, icky territory, I don't like it. But mm. I mean, I think that's kind of the point of these film series, isn't it? Yes, it's meant to be. It's making us question our relationship with animals and our own humanity. Absolutely, and where the power lies and you know, trying yeah. to take control. Anyway, this one's going to take place many years after the events of War for the Planet of the Apes, which was the final film in a trilogy of films from Matt Reeves, which started in 2011 with Rise of the Planet of the Apes and then Dawn of the Planet of the Apes in 2014. They are excellent films. I know you you don't resonate with them so much. I have seen bits of them Mm. and 
Andy Circus's work, his physicality and his motion capture work is fantastic. Insane. So I do appreciate that aspect of them, mm. but I'm just not super into them personally. So Matt Reeves won't be returning to the franchise. He's done now with his trilogy of recent years. So we'll have Wes Ball, who directed the Maze Runner trilogy, mm-hmm. and it will star Owen Teague, Freya Allen, and Peter Macon. So Steve Asbell, the president of 20th Century Studios, said in a statement, Planet of the Apes is one of the most iconic and storied science fiction franchises in film history, as well as being an indelible part of our studio's legacy. With Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes, we are privileged to continue the series tradition of imaginative, thought-provoking cinema and can't wait to share Wes's extraordinary vision for this new chapter with audiences in 2024. I'd like to throw this out to our audience. Hmm. Hop on our socials. Tell me, am I wrong for not getting into this franchise? That's a very good question. Mm. Well, tell you what, Steve sounds pretty bloody pumped, doesn't he? Are you are you pro <laughs> Planet of the Apes or against? Are you on Team Steve or Team Lee? <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking forward to it if you want my opinion. I didn't ask for it, but I'll take it. <laughs> I'll give it. Now, look, this is pure rumour, but I, I want to end the episode with this piece of news. So Harrison Ford is rumoured to take on the General Ross role in Marvel Studios' Thunderbolts movie. I quite like this rumour. I, I hope it. it comes true. Yes, me too. Let's manifest this shit. So William Hurt previously played Ross in so many MCU films, but he passed away earlier in 2022, sadly. Mm. And there's been no confirmation from Ford or Kevin Feige on this casting news, but I think it's a really good fit. I mean, look, they're on a bit of a roll at the moment with pretty wild casting mm. announcements with obviously, as we mentioned at the top of the news section, oh, I just want to say it again, Hugh Jackman returning <laughs> as Wolverine. So, I mean, this excites me, Harrison Ford, in my opinion, seems to be a really good replacement for William Hurt's mm. character here. You know, General Ross, we've seen him, I think first saw him in the one of the Hulk movies back in back in the day. Yeah, when what's he played him? Back in 2008. Was in that the Edward Norton or Eric Norton. Norton. Banner? Was the Edward first Norton. One. Okay, yeah. He was in that. We've never seen his daughter Betty in the current MCU, have we? Bring back Liv Tyler. <laughs> I know, she was awesome. She was great. Look, what did Feige just say? Anything's possible in the multiverse. Yep. We're manifesting a few things today. <laughs> we are. Manifest with us. <laughs> and that's it for another episode of Popcorn Podcast. We covered See How They Run, which is in cinemas from September 29. And as always, podcast friends, movie-loving friends, thank you so much for listening. Oh, we'll catch you next time. <laughs> we have a website, popcornpodcast.com. Make sure you check it out. We've got all our episodes up there for you. If you'd like to get to know us a little better, there's an About Us section and we run ticket giveaways. So keep an eye on the website for more information.